Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends, as I like to start most videos with a bit of an introduction, just saying hello to everyone joining in with the stream tonight. Uh, my name is Matt Bailey. I'm going to bring in our cellar master who's just joining us now for Friday evening with wine and spice, Mr. Derbage. Welcome to the stream. Oh, uh, we've got a bit of audio problem here. We're not getting any feed in just yet. That's, that's okay. That, that's because the, the dipstick at this end had his microphone on mute. Um, I am very well. It is a pleasure to see you. Uh, and it's good to see you. And, and you're looking well, I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. You too. You are always looking well, though. You know what? You've got this timeless ability. You haven't literally have not aged a day in 10 years, and I'm still liking to know your secret, but that's okay. Yeah, I, that might be true, but the trouble is I still look 60 every freaking day. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, you just need to adjust the shaver down a little bit closer, right? You know, it's... <laughs> It's timeless, timeless. <laughs> Greetings to all members, everyone tuning in tonight. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, Friday night virtual. Um, lots of comments already coming in, of course. Whiskey is my jam, who's always pretty much first off the rank. There you are. Uh, Mark Teague as well, who might have some relation to Whiskey is my jam, not really sure. And then um, happy Friday, everyone from Scott Brickhill. Scott, it's been a while. Hope you're well, mate. Hope you're in good spirits. And I hope everyone who's joining us tonight, I know there's quite a few people who are going to be joining in later on who are watching, who will be watching this for later. Some joining us live, which is great. Hey, gents from Mr. Leyland, good to see you. Um, so good to see everyone joining in. This is, of course, you can tag us, of course, on Instagram. Always welcome to say hello. There it is, at SNWS underscore AUS. Of course, this is our wine and spice virtual tasting hosted by the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Now, this was part of our Feb outturn, uh, and I'm just going to bring that up for us to see here. That's even better. Um, this is part of our Feb tasting. Feb outturn, there's the, there's the cover. There's the outturn. That's what it looks like. And we're now heading into March, of course, around the corner. But this was part of our wine and spice. A really interesting theme for us in February to kick off our first official outturn of the year. So um, thanks to everyone who jumped in. Um, wine and spice. This is where it started. Now, whilst we, before we talk too much and get too involved, you might want to pour 2.124, your sweet, fruity, and mellow in your pack there, making your mind up. There was a very deliberate decision to put this one in the first of the lineup. It's the only ex-bourbon cask whiskey in the lineup tonight. It's all well, about wine and spice, wine casks and and their influence. It's, let's 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 clarify that by saying it's the only one that uh, hasn't gone into a, a second cask for finishing. That's right. Yeah, for for for, for extra maturation or, or whatnot. Um, so I'll just bring it up so you can see the uh, on the screen there. Cask two dot one two four is where we're going to start. So you can pour that and just let that sort of ease into the glass for a moment because the idea behind using this as a Sorry, a bit of noise outside. Uh, the idea behind using this uh, as the first whiskey is kind of like a cal calibration point in a way. Uh, not too dissimilar to a, um, not too dissimilar to a, I guess, welcome dram, if you like. But it's a very good welcome dram. It's a 14-year-old single cask from Distillery 2. I tell you what, if, if I was hosting a tasting and we had this as the welcome dram, I'd suggest you're in for a, a damn good tasting. Uh, I, I'd, I'd feature this as the welcome dram anytime. <laughs> I think... Uh, some, sometimes uh, that can almost sound a bit disparaging to say, oh, this is just the dram we're going to have first up to, to set the tone for the rest of the night. But I, I, this this stands on its own two feet any time. Of course, you're absolutely right. It, the purpose of having something, uh, for want of a better word, let's say unadulterated, uh, let's try something that is just straight out of a bourbon cast first and then use that for comparison as our benchmark to see the impact of uh, the other casks as we come to, to the other four whiskies and see how each one of those has been changed, tweaked, um, adjusted, manipulated, courtesy of uh, of the wine casks. Mm, yeah, and, and how that impact has has taken on with the um with the uh, I guess the ex wine cask into the spirit. There's an article that was written in um, in the outturn called Wine and Spice, which is the, the name of the the, uh, the month that it was, um, which you can see up on screen at the moment. We've sort of delved into some of the differences between wine casks and bourbon casks, and uh, some of the flavors that, that might provide. Um, what characteristics that takes on. I think one of the first things to really recognize between the difference between wine casks and ex-bourbon casks is the construction. Is that their wine casks are pretty and beautiful and have nice crozes and loops and hoops and chains and bits and bobs to them that actually make them quite uh, watertight and, and hold wine. Uh, ex-bourbon barrels, are not so much. They, I mean, they are very much part of, part of, the, um, part of the trade and are very much a, a very industrial and, and practical solution. Uh, not as pretty as a wine cask, but they, 
what we also want to dig into is, especially for tonight, is the flavors of why those uh, wine casks provide such a different um, element to the, each of these whiskies. So uh, let's just, but before we get too, di, 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 too stuck into it, um, let's have a nose and taste of this 2.124. Mm. I, I can see in the comments here, people aren't wasting time. Uh, we haven't even got through this one and people are asking about uh, the tasting kit for our next virtual, Matt. Uh, uh, <laughs> be, be, be patient, Mr. Burns. At, uh, we're, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. That's a that's a lovely nose, isn't it? It is. It. You know what? I think our two. I think the twos that we get through at the society. Are, uh, I, I. 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 I know. I say this sometimes, but they are pretty underrated. It, it's. It's such a. It's such a colossally well known distillery. It's the best selling single malt in America. It's one of the best selling single malts around the world, um, and for good reason. Uh, and it's. It's. It's always. It's. It's a, a distillate. It's always taken on a much lighter character than most. Um, uh, like than most, I mean, it, it's quite. It's all. I always get that pear drops, uh, uh, pear drops and sort of light, fluffy barley kind of notes off off this dis off this distillery. Mm. At a single cask at fourteen years, I think it's it's picked up a lot more though. Yeah, I think I think it's definitely uh, a brand that, in in an ironic and sad way, suffers because it is just such a huge brand, and mm. and uh, and just like its its other neighbour that uh, that is nearby and, and equally a large selling product. Um, yeah, uh, people uh, tend to disparage it. Oh, you know, uh, it's it's such a such a huge selling product, mass produced product. Um, it can't be any good. And and just think about the logic of that. That makes no sense. It's the biggest selling in, in a particular country like the USA, second biggest selling mold in the world. Clearly, it's they're making damn good spirit. Uh, and this is a great example of it. It it kind of reminds me of that uh, quote that, you know that I've said before about the bashing blends is silly. And, you know, it's like some of the best-selling whiskies in the world are blended whiskies, and for good reason because they're consistent. Yeah, exactly right. Oh, yeah, that cloudy some... an aid note on this one. Sorry, I was going to say it's 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 a bit warm on the palate. Um, straight away, I, I think you know this is actually one that could probably do with a drop or two of water. Let's give that a try. <laughs> yes, Matt. Let's, let's. Yeah, yeah, let's. A uh, planned segue, <laughs> no, unplanned planned segue. What's this one sitting at? Fifty five point four. So it's not actually, it's not too high. But it, it gets, it's not up there, but it, oh. for me, it just uh, first strike on the palate. Um, let me think that. And, and do you know what? Having now added water, uh, it, it it's actually bringing up some notes of sherbet on mm -hmm. the um, on the nose. And you mentioned pear drops before. Something I I find in this distillate. Uh, uniformly across all the expressions of it I've tried is is a really gentle citrus and it's it's more of an orange citrus uh, it's very famous neighbor nearby I find uh, um, usually has a lemon citrus note to it but but uh, this particular one uh, as I say there's that orange citrus and just a little drop of water I added to mine just brought a, a splash of that out mm. tiny hint of, of, of orange citrus spray if we're going to be um, poetic about it Ah, a spritzer. Yeah, indeed. I am. Um, for those who've just tuned in, we are tasting the first cask tonight, which is cask 2.124, making your mind up in the sweet fruity and mellow profile. Uh, I think there's still a few of this one left. I think it's maybe a, a dozen or so of this one still available. So if you are enjoying this, of course, the bottles are available on the website tonight of this particular cask. But I, I like I said, I, I'm going to keep um, I'm going to keep at least half of my sample still kicking about for a little bit here because I'm using this um, as the benchmark, almost like like I say, we wanted to go with something really sort of like, I guess neutral is not the wrong right 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 word here, but like a, a whiskey that's quite uh, approachable and ex bourbon cask, fourteen year old distillery to really so just to hold it all together and say, okay, this is what we often see. We often see really good. Um, first fill, second fill, refill, bourbon casks um, from unpeated distillates. And now we're going to be heading into some territory, which is definitely takes us on a different uh, different journey into wine and spice. Um, I did, I did, I was going to just quickly make mention of how um, this was the second distillery to ever join the society. And I think that's kind of cool that we, we're still getting a, a regular supply of twos coming through from the SMWS. And there's 2.1, which is uh, where it all began with distillery two. And uh, I think it was a very cool very cool call to have number two in there and it would have been a big brand even then uh to bring into the society so it's sort of 
starting with number one and then hitting to two dot one is what showed that this society was going through a phase of growth and showing that we were enjoying some uh the spoils of some good casks coming through so now we're oh, up to uh, one to two four which is I'll, I'll, I'll tell you an interesting thing that uh the, the commercial expression of uh of distillery two was actually the very first single malt i ever bought ah. yeah as as a 13 year old <laughs> uh uh and he said as an 18 year old it was the very first whiskey he bought no 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 i, it, it, I was 13 years old it was father's day i went into the, uh, this, okay. and this probably gives you some indication of, of the time and this, uh, possibly how lax um alcohol retailing was at the time but i as a 13 year old i went into a local bottle shop picked up uh the 12 year old from distillery too and uh went to the counter and and explained that it was a, a Father's Day present for my dad. And the guy said, sure, and handed over the cash <laughs> and away I went. So. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. Sure, kid, sure. <laughs> sure. Well, I, I, I gave it to my dad. I never got a drop of it. But, uh, yeah, I've never forgotten. That was that was the first single malt I ever bought. And was that sort of like a Glenlivet pure malt or was that like a 12-year-old? or? Well, well, at the yeah, it did have an age statement at the time. It was just called Glen Glen Twelve. You're probably right. It, it would have had pure malt on the label. Now, mm. now that I think about it, it was that classic, uh, you know, the, or the yellow creamy uh, label with the with the red and green uh, yep. brown. Uh, sorry, border around it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would have been fantastic. I have to say, as, as twelve year olds go, and for for the price, uh, very very acceptable whiskey. Oh, yeah, yeah, very very much so. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Uh, that 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 sounds like a much uh, much more um, um, dire story. Whoever wrote that one, I had to go buy my my mum's cigarettes when I was eight. <laughs> That's too bad, eh? Um, we're going to go on to the next whiskey in just a moment. Um, follow the treacle trail. Um, oops, I've gone wrong way on these slides. Um, from a distillery seventy eight. Now, I realised when preparing for tonight, we've actually never featured a seventy eight in a virtual before. Um, and it would have been very long ago since we last saw a 78 uh, in the Australian branch. Uh, and this is the first very one true. in quite some time. Uh, and most of a few coming through, which is which is great. Um, would, it, would it be fair to say that uh, Distillery 78 has a very, very small niche cult following? Yeah, it does. It does. It definitely does, especially with recent news. Um, I think that sort of changed it a little bit as well. Um, but yes. I, yeah. yeah. Does have a bit of a cult following, and and I think for good reason. It's it it's a bit like Distillery Eighteen, also in tonight's lineup. There's, it's one of those distilleries that sort of like if once you've had a bit of time in your malt journey, you sort of go, oh, okay, what's all this about, and what what is this distillery, and it's got a cool name, and it's also got a name that's been used in different capacities in in Scotch whiskey over the uh, over the centuries, and it's kind of like got a sort of a cool bit of history behind it, and oh, now when when the lovely Susie tours in our office was um helping pack all these bottles together, she had to call me at one point and say, have you tasted this 78 yet? And I said, no, I haven't. She said, it's got the best nose. And she said, it just had the most amazing nose of a whiskey. I'm, I'm just getting the most extraordinary notes of, of caramel and uh, custard and um, a fruit flan pudding. It's 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 rich and it's dense. It's dense. I think you could spend a, a, a lot of time, as our friend Anthony Cowie would say, you, you could unpack this for quite some time. Wow. You get like a maple syrup note, like maple syrup and pancakey kind of note there? Hugely, hugely. Pretty, yeah. sort of pretty pancakes, maple notes. Now, just let's just touch on this cast for a second. Second fill charred red wine barrique. Now, if you'd read out turn, you, you've worked out the, uh, you've probably seen the seven different wine cask terms that have been deciphered in there one of which was the word barrique let's go to that what does it say barrique a fancy french word for barrel there you go you've um, got to say it with a gallic shrug though it's barrique barrique it was from a barrique but um yeah it's 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 a it's a fancy way of saying barrel but it means it's a french uh it's would be a french red wine barrique second fill chard and it says in the tasting notes after spending six years in an ex-bourbon hogshead this was transferred to a second fill red wine barrique for the remainder of its maturation. So it's an, it had an extra, full extra four years of maturation in the second fill red wine cask. And it hasn't overly impacted the the, the color, let alone the, the flavor, I'd say as well. I mean, it's it's clearly not just wine, wine, wine cask, which some whiskies can suffer from, um, which we've done, we don't bottle, but they are certainly the, the wine cask here is, I'd say, really lifting this into that, like we said, mapley thick un, like nose going on here. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, 
I'm going to take a punt, Matt. I, I reckon uh, this would benefit from just a little bit of time and, and, and aeration. Mm. I'm going to swell for a bit and maybe um, whilst we okay. do that, mm. I thought it might be worth just spending a couple of minutes just having a quick chat about, you know, wine finishes in general. Um, yeah. If, if you're a punter and you jump on the internet and you, and you search up wine finish, um, there's a lot of very poorly researched articles and, and blog pieces out there. And um, almost invariably, you'll, you'll find some piece of writing somewhere that says that it was Glenn Moringy that pioneered uh, wine finishes. Mm. Um, and they certainly pioneered the commercialization of it. In other words, coming up with a bottling, uh, finishing it in, a, in another wine cask, and then making it part of their core range. And, and I, I think, you know, most people would agree Glen Morangy were, were the first to do that, but they weren't necessarily the first to actually produce a finished whiskey. And, and that honour um, goes to uh, Balvini uh, and particularly uh, David Stewart, who was the master blender there, part of the William um, Grant and Sons uh, portfolio. Of course, he was looking after uh, Glen Fittick and um, uh, Balvini at the time. Um, and if you, if you really dig deep and, and ask all the people at the time, it was David Stewart actually who was uh, credited as being the first to actually take some spirit that had been in a bourbon cask and then finish it for a short period of time uh, in, in a sherry cask. Um, and then, you know, others uh, saw the benefit in that and, and started trialling it. It was Glenn Moringy who then came out later on with the, the first of their, at the time they had three releases in their portfolio. There was the sherry wood. Uh, the um, Burgundy and Madeira, if I remember correctly. I think I've got that right. I think it's right, yeah. Uh, port, I'm sorry, a big part of it was Port. Sher Sherry, Port and Madeira. Um, and the rest is history. And, you know, there, there was a long time there where getting a whiskey that was finished was quite an exotic, unusual thing. Uh, now you'd have to say it's actually fairly passe uh, as a concept. Obviously, the, the flavours and the results and the whiskies we get are, are still brilliant. Um, and, you know, Glenn Morangy in particular have gone on to... Uh, uh, really push the envelope in every every way they can with different woods and, and wines, uh, wine casks and finishes as, as you have it. But um, still, for me, uh, as par se as the concept is, I still find it's a very um, uh, interesting and dynamic space. Mm, absolutely. And you can be you could be probably sure, though, however, you say that, you know, like Glenn Renji pioneered the commercialization of it and Balvenie pioneered the uh, actual sort of casking of it. Um, there's probably there probably were other distilleries at the time finishing uh, whiskey in other casks, even if it was from ex -burb, refill ex bourbon into first fill ex bourbon or, or whatnot. Who probably then sort of went, ah, oh, wait, we've been doing that for years, but we never really sort of actually you know released it as such. Well, yeah, look, possibly I, I, I did a bit of a deep dive into that very topic about 10, 12 years ago and, and came up empty um, and asked a lot of people who were, you know, serious people in the trade at the time and you know, no one sort of ever really said that. The other possibility is that there may have been some distilleries that did it, um, chose their, their cast poorly or did the wrong thing with it and had a bad result and therefore uh, kept stum about it. <laughs> very true. In, in fact, one of my favourite parts of all that was, uh, in Glen Rangie's case, the first release of their Portwood expression uh, was released only in a 350 mil bottle uh, because they weren't sure whether it was going to be a success or not. And I guess they didn't want to risk putting it all into 700 mil bottles or whatnot. What and so sort of like a test it and see sort of approach with these smaller size bottles. And the proof on it was also respectively something like 48.7% or something like that. It was high 40s, low 50s sort of proof on the first Portwood before they brought it back to 40. And it was a... Uh, yeah, I've been lucky enough to taste one of them, and it was, it was stunning stuff. Like, really, like, obviously, lots of port influence and, and a very different from how, uh, what do they call it, um, Quinta Ruban is today. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, but, um, yeah, no, this is this is very exciting. This is, I always find the Distillery 78, the, the spirit, to be quite, um, uh, I guess, quite, yeah, quite thick and nutty. Uh, it's, you could, you could almost, I'd say you could almost confuse it for a 68 sometimes in, in, in profile. I mean, that sort of, nutty sort of i'm gonna say blair athol profile a little bit um but you could I, i've maybe a little bit of that going on that sort of nuttiness in their spirit that i quite like and do you think uh that's that's a deliberate ploy given uh the owning company and where a lot of the casks eventually end up and the product that uh it gets blended with to to uh, produce produce something else <laughs> that's going to be the most round away roundabout way of saying i have no idea what you're talking about your honor where you you phrased that question <laughs> would you like would you like me to be more direct <laughs> yeah yeah no no oh, look i mean a lot of their distillate does go into japanese blending 
and has done in the past. I think that's that's going to be coming to an end. So, although I mean, or at least the labelling will change. But certainly, um, certainly the labelling. Yeah, I don't, I don't think the, the the practice will per se. But um, uh, look, at the end of the day, um, you know, Nick uh, uh, use a, a good chunk of this for for, for their products, and they're obviously. Uh, going to be wanting something rich and robust that they can add their their local uh, lighter spirit to. Um, so it, you know, I, I could I could fully accept that the instructions are being sent to the distillery to produce a, a rich nutty malt, mm, a very a very chewy texture as well. I mean, yeah. which is probably you know, that's uh, wooden washbacks and brewers yeast. It's one of the last doing that. It's a very, uh, very uh, industrial distillery. Uh, when when you go to visit there, that, that shed out the back that I think was um, almost looks like uh, the work experience student just got some really large pieces of a Meccano set and built a built a warehouse at the back, and then they, they put the <laughs> distillery in there. And it's 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 that classic, uh, you know, late sixties, early seventies. Um, uh, I'm not even going to use the word architecture actually, because that that would be generous. It's it's not architecture. It's just it's just industrial construction. Well, that's a very, uh, you had a very decade specific re uh, reference there with Meccano at the very least, you know, so. Yeah. Well, we, we established at the start of this conversation, I, I perennially look 60, so, you know. You know. <laughs> I did not say that. I did not say that, just for the record. <laughs> um, there's a great comment here. The 7-8 is definitely a lively dram, indeed. And there's another great comment here saying there is some tannins from the wine there. I was wondering how long it would take someone to say the T word, which is also talked about in the uh, deciphering terms what are tannins and they're probably i start by saying they're probably the most misunderstood part of nature they're not a bad thing they're not a good thing they're just a thing and they are everywhere they're in dark chocolate they're in steaks they're in walnuts cranberries cacao grapes it's all in it's in everything it's in oak it's in it's uh it's in wine so it's it's in it's and it can vary between it's that grippy texture that's desirable when you have a nice grippy red wine you go that's really just grabs the sides of your cheek uh, and then other times where the wine cask perhaps hasn't interacted as well with the spirit as you'd like, and maybe you're finding that spirit a little bit too grippy or a little bit too tannic. But uh, I think tannins are misunderstood, and they can be a good thing, and they can really sort of – I think – I'll be honest, I think the tannins in this are just right. I think they really do sort of sit there. They're a little bit grippy but in a nice way. Yeah, for, for me, I don't think I'd want any more tannin influence than this, and certainly when you when you start dancing with red wine casks, you've, you've got to dance very carefully. Um uh, this for me is, is about at my threshold. Uh, Jesse, I love your I love your tasting notes coming through. Layers to the taste as well. Dark hot chocolate and burnt cinnamon buck. Olive oil on salting crackers. Yes, uh, that would be a very tannic thing. And hot grapes that explode after being th being out in the sun. Can I uh, off, offer my suggestion uh, to everyone? I added a drop of water, actually more than a drop, uh, to my dram, and boy, is it singing now. Uh, for yep. me, this is this is a dram that has seriously improved with water. I'm going to give that a go. It's funny you mention that. I just want to talk about water whilst we're on this second whiskey. You and I have said this before that you know adding water to ex bourbon whiskies often improves them. It, it opens them right up a bit, especially cast strength. Um, we tread carefully when adding water to sherry whiskies, and we almost never add water to to really old whiskies. Where where would where would you think on that scope on that sort of scale? Do you think like wine casks would sit? in that regard because it's that's a bit of a that might be a tricky one for members at home wondering do you add water to wine casks and i know it's all very subjective but what would you say i, I think it's very difficult to be too general about it because there's there's just such a huge range of wine casks being used um you look at what glenn Mur murray were doing uh, 15 20 years ago with their chardonnay mellowed uh, that was the term they used chardonnay mellowed uh bottlings um they were they were so soft and sublime and i, I wouldn't put mm. a drop of water near them um you and I have both had plenty of um, uh, red wine influence uh, casks, and certainly some port uh, finished casks that I think do could could do with the drop. This conversation so far is being kept in the realm of Scotch whiskey. I think when you look at the Australian whiskey industry, there's obviously a lot of Australian distillers uh, making prolific use of, of wine casks, uh, and I've found um, uh, some of those definitely need a drop of water, particularly the ones that that start to get on the tannic side, and, and there's a few there. Uh, so yeah, I'm not sure I can give a, uh, a hard and fast rule. I, I think, uh, like any whiskey, uh, sip it, make your own judgment, and then add what you feel you need to add to to make it enjoyable for you. Mm, absolutely, good call. I think it, I, I've had I've added water to that 78, and I completely agree with you. That's just opened up so nicely. Hasn't it just yet? Yeah. It's now become like um, 
I'm getting wine gums. Uh, yeah. Remember the, fr the freaky yeah. wine gum lollies? The, sugar, the sugared wine gum lollies? Like That's it, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we used to call them uh, wine jubes when I, was, when I was growing up in Canberra. But... Yeah, yeah. I think, that, yeah. Those, are they still called that? I don't know. I thought they were. I don't know, mate. It was, it was so last century. Oh, I mean, jubes is probably now a bad word or something as well. It probably is, yes. Who it's... knows? Who knows? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a bad word, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, that's seventy eight. I think we might pour the next whiskey and have a chat. You're welcome to go at your own pace at home, of course. We're just um, exploring each one. But God, I, I got to just again echo um, um, just some fantastic comments coming through. Jesse, those those are those. I'm going to throw it up on screen again. Those comments, like those tasting notes, are so good. So keep them coming through. Thank you. And the uh, the, the terroir of the wine comes through. Okay. Ooh, you've been you've been working on your pronunciation. You <laughs> Sorry, the terror, the terror you, you, of the one. You got, you got that perfect. I still struggle with it. It's it's a word I trip on every time when I. Um, oh right, okay, yeah. When I, when I try and say it at a tasting, and and then I just sound more drunk than I really am. So. I... <laughs> yeah. No. No tastings, including that word, please. Yes. Uh, and yeah, I I know which ones you're, you're referencing there, Paul. Um, Longro have done some great. Uh, they even did an Australian ex-Shiraz cask, I think, at one point as well. They've, they've experimented with the, with their Red Series, I think they used to be called. Um, I found that series to be very, uh, what's the word, very hit or miss. There were some great ones in there and some okay ones in there. Um, but I, I I don't know. Much like Andrew, I mean, I, I think I'm quite fussy about wine casks these days. Um, but it's a, it's I, very... I, I think you've, you've nailed it, Matt. I, I really think that they are hits or misses. There, there doesn't seem to be much middle ground uh no, they, no. They, either sh they either shine uh, so let's let's just talk about something else for a moment uh, do, do you mind uh, do, yeah, do no, have a minute or two yeah, yeah, yeah um let's not also ignore the fact that that wine casks have been used very strategically by some distilleries to try and polish up or breed a bit of bring a bit of interest and sparkle to some very uh tired casks that were otherwise past it and um i don't know if we need to name names or not but there's this you know some very well-known distilleries that uh were rescued, you know, uh, bought by by new enterprises and brought back from the from the dead, and and they inherited a very aging inventory of, of stock that had been put into very tired old casks, and they had to uh, inject and breathe a bit of life into them. And the first way they did that was to re rack them into uh, wine casks just to try and put some sparkle and life back into them and resuscitate some of them. Um, you know, uh, Ben Reek did a fantastic job of that. Brooke Laddie as well. Um, but uh, sometimes. Um, What's that saying? You, 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 <laughs> you can't polish something, but you can roll it in glitter. Uh, <laughs> so, some, some, sometimes it doesn't always work. Yeah. Um, and, or the, or you can lipstick on a pig. Yeah. All right. Well. Yeah. Uh, let's let's pour it. Let's pour an eighteen dot three seven. Trippy tagine. Now this this is a distillery that you're not going to encounter very often, and much like Distillery Seventy Eight. Is very much a whiskey nerd out kind of distillery, and you speak well, to people who have jumped into this before and gone, "Ah, oh, like, oh, have you tried many of these?" And you're like, oh, "Maybe one, you know, like maybe three. I was about to say, it, it's if, if it's got a following, it's a very nerdy following because uh, hardly anyone knows this place exists. It's oh, it's... I'm actually, I'm actually, yeah, president of the fan club. Yeah, um, well, you know, okay, uh, you'll hey, get my, there's uh, three of us now around the country. Come on, <laughs> you'll, you'll get my membership application form tomorrow. Um, <laughs> Let's have a nose of this. Whilst we're having a nose of this, uh, eighteen dot three seven. I don't actually have any cool uh, photos of this distillery to show you, but I wanted to show you this kind of um, just a bit of this actually. So, just an overview of of this one. Here we go. I've actually I've been there. Man.
Sorry, I cut you off there. The video cut you off. I didn't realize it was going to trigger straight yeah, away. Well, Sorry. I, I didn't either, but I was just going to say, I've, I've actually been there. And uh, just at the very end of that video, as it panned by, you could see uh, the name of the distillery on uh, what I believe was the old uh, maltings floor. And that's that's the one bit you can see from the main road as, as you drive along there. So it sort of stands out. But um, very, it's a, it's a, I'm going to use an architectural building term here, but it's very low rise distillery. It doesn't raise up high uh, above the ground. Um, and it's surrounded by um, uh, farm fields. It's like it's in the middle of a paddock. Uh, so uh, very, as, as quiet and as little known as the distillery is from a branding point of view, it's, it's all geographically. It, it just, it, you wouldn't know to see. You've almost got to look at, uh, be on the lookout for it to see it as, you, as you're driving by. Mm. Yeah. That it's, is a it's, beautiful nose. Beautiful nose on it. It's it's not a, um, it's not a very uh, well-known distillery, as we are saying before that video clip played. It's, it's very, um, you know, sort of like the, like I say, some of the nerds talk about this as sort of one of their sort of like hidden gems kind of things. And I think for good reason, because their spirit is fantastic. Uh, it definitely usually it's this kind of spirit we find would normally fall into one Orleans coastal flavor profile, but this one uh, falls into juicy oak and vanilla. And is um, uh, if you like distilleries like Klein Leash, like Highland Park, I think you'd be sort of, uh, you'd be missing out on something if you just sort of overlooked this one. Uh, and it's because it's that, coastal sort of element to a lot of their spirit uh being a coastal distillery and and um and quite a quite an interesting rich malt character i i, I think uh, that you've nailed it and the other thing too uh and it, it became evident in that in that video that with, with the reference to bells if you mm. think about uh bell scotch as a brand it was always a very light um delicate uh, blend um, let's not forget also, you know, Bladnock was, it was a major component of that. And you, you think about Bladnock as a spirit, uh, mm. and what it contributed to it. This was all part of that, that family. <laughs> just in the middle of talking and giving that last sentence, my mouth was salivating just from uh, what this whiskey's done. It's, it's drawing out, uh, it's, it's, it's a juicy whiskey. It's, it's sensational. That's unreal. I actually really like that. That's yeah. Um, I think there's some of these available. Uh, I think, um, I'm just going to quickly check. I, I can't remember. I'm sorry. I didn't uh, didn't check that out before we started. No, no. I, I, ha I had a quick note from Susie on um, which ones are still available. And the only one that isn't available anymore is actually the um, Follow the Treacle Trail, which was one of our weekly releases. It's yeah. uh, just the other week. It's completely sold out. Trippy Tajin, there is still some available. It's 185 and it's on the it's on the site now. There's 14 available. So No, th 13, I'm sorry. Uh, 12, one. Actually 12, yeah. I, I think yeah. I might have to get one of these. This is um this is really nice. Oh, I've got the wrong caption up. Sorry. There we go. Um, Juicy Camdella, 13 year old, second fill charred red wine barrique. Isn't it amazing? If you've got a little bit left of your 78, just do a side by side of this and that and just how far apart they are, yet they've had time in a very, very similar cask. They've both had time in a second fill. Uh, they are chalk and cheese. Fortunately, I like chalk and cheese, so that's good. Together? Uh, not together, but side and by side, they, they work well. <laughs> um, another great tasting note coming through from Jesse. Fresh oak, moss after rain, and plenty of vanilla malt. All the company was an icing sugar sweetness. Tempted to add water. Tempted, yeah, I am too. I might give that. A, I might give that a bit of a bump with a drop of water. Well, I'm I'm going to uh, defer to your judgment there, but I have no desire to add water to this at all. I, I think it's perfect for me. At sixty-one percent, might it might hold up, all right? And I think that's my point. Like at sixty-one percent, yeah. it, it it it's certainly not harsh or aggressive. It's uh, it's delivering beautifully. I'm going to go light on the water. Okay, yeah, even just on the nose. Don't do it. <laughs> 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 uh, it's still good. I just think it doesn't need it. That's actually an abbreviation we used to use on a local tasting panel many, many years ago, DDI. It was, it was just don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, it's... Yeah, I mean, you, you said it before. I mean, it is, it's a significant part of Bell's. And we talk, we just touched on that very early on about how blended whiskey is such a backbone of, of the whiskey trade. And bells would still be a part of that. Uh, would still use this, as would other Diageo blends. And so infrequently seen as a single malt. It doesn't have a single malt brand. It doesn't have a, a core range. Uh, it's infrequently at most seen uh, in independent bottlings. Um, yeah, so yeah. Even even independent bottlings. Like you think you see some distilleries out there that don't have a core range, and you see a lot of independent bottlings of them, which is great. Uh, 
this one is is neither it has no core range and has very very few seen so, you know, as independently bottled spirit yeah no, agreed very it's absolute just, use vanilla as well it's it's just giving and giving for me it, it, it's mm. it, the more you leave it in the glass the more it starts to grow and expand each repeated sip just becomes more and more enjoyable on the palate some some people uh would I, i've not, i've never agreed with the term i i i i I don't think it's a particularly attractive term, but but uh, I can imagine a lot of people would call this a session dram because you could just keep going and going on it. And uh, mm. Mm. I certainly could, but um, I'd, I'd use the term. It's a, it's an endearing and enduring dram. I wouldn't call sixty one percent very sessionable though. It's going to hurt the next morning if you call, if you use that as a sessionable dram. Oh, I disagree. When when it's clean, <laughs> when it's clean, yeah, yeah. Actually, sure. it maybe is a bit of a precursor to the uh, the rum uh, night virtue we've got coming up next month. We did a, a, a huge, huge rum tasting for the society in Sydney uh, back in uh, 15 or so, 2015 maybe. And that was back when the society was bottling those huge rums at sort of, you know, between 70 and 84% alcohol. And we had a number of them that night and it was it was just enormous. Um, and and the, the, the alcohol that was served that night, both in terms of concentration and potency and all the rest of it was just huge. And myself and many others remarked uh, the next day we woke up just feeling a million dollars and spectacular because mm. it was just such good quality, distillate and great spirit and, and you know, no nasties coming from cask or anything else. So I'm, I'm a firm believer. Um, mm. No, no, it's, no, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's, it's, the, it's the spirit and, and, and what else is in there rather than just simply the ABV per se. Mm. Oh. What a beaut drop. Just lovely. It's good to see some 18s through again uh, as well. Um, yeah. Like this. Well, it's been a while. This is only cast 37. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, I think I checked this out before. I think this is like cast 37 and maybe dot three six was UK and and or US or something. But before that, uh, last one we saw was like red bold code. So like 2015, 16 sort of bottlings. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna. Uh change topic for a little bit or tack i should say rather than topic and suggest i reckon this would go absolutely sensational with a really really nice crisp lager oh, well <laughs> what's this sitting on my desk ah uh, just a can of kolsch who knows who a knows Kolsch? okay I, look I, I was thinking peroni if, if there was a if there was a bottle of peroni handy here i, I reckon that would go down a treat yeah it would I think it'd pair up nicely, wouldn't it? It's a, it's a very. Th I think. I think the reason you could be saying that is because it's quite a thick spirit, and something like a, a crisp lager might just cut through nicely on that one. I, for me, it's the maltiness. I, mm. I, I, there's just a beautiful maltiness in, in the whiskey that uh, I just want to pair with a, with another drink made from malt, and, and um, mm. <laughs> beer, beer uh, quickly comes to mind. Ooh. That's lovely. I'm going to park just a little bit of that. Uh, uh, that's, you know, would, would, would you agree with me that uh, the wine cask influence on this on that one is um, not massive? Yeah, it's if if I if, let's put it this way: if I didn't read that it was X wine cask, I wouldn't have known it's X wine cask. Yeah, I, 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 exactly. Well put. I mean, um, I, I could have said that maybe it was just a really active first fill or something, or uh, first fill X bourbon or something like, or, or maybe uh, you know, like re re refill sherry kind of thing. But uh, it's. <laughs> what's that term re re refill sherry yeah, yeah re re refill sherry like you know like fourth fill sherry or something i don't know but it could have been something that's really um no i wouldn't have picked the x1 influence on that but i think I, I, it's obviously lifted it and changed the profile and and that extra maturation has done something special there but that's uh i like our uh, our friends at glenn farkless if they had to refer to a re re refill sherry cask we just call it a plain cask but um plain cask <laughs> yeah yeah transport vessel yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i'll be a drop uh that uh i've probably had four maybe five single malts from this distillery uh I'd yeah put probably that up, but I'd put that up maybe the I, not many I, I think it's that's the best one i've ever had yeah, I, I had one from another independent bottler, uh, which may involve the letters G and M in their name, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that was that was good. With an and in between. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mm, it's extraordinary. Wow. <laughs> no, that's lovely. It's it's um 
it's very thick multi spirit and that's i something I, I i know we've said this before as well but like something we've not touched on really enough ever before it, it, we, we don't touch on enough when talking about these flavors is purely just texture and mouthfeel yeah and that one is, is like sometimes you want a whiskey that's kind of light and floral and just sort of coats the tongue for a second and then but other times you want something that is like pouring a tube of lanolin into your mouth and it's like oh look at that you know that kind of moment that's probably a deep dive for another day but but i i, I do believe the the more time you spend with whiskey and the longer that your your uh, whiskey journey goes for i.e the longer you've been drinking for the more mouthfeel and texture just really starts to uh, play an important role for you in your enjoyment of a dram mm. absolutely I think when you, when you start out, it's all about flavour. As, as you get a, a bit of experience under your belt, you, you start to turn your attention to the nose and, and you know, the, the nose tends to uh, play an increasing role. And, and then, yeah, with, with real time, you then start to focus on texture and character. Great comment here from uh, Normal. It says the two is interesting to return to. Well, that was the point of it. So if you've got a drop in that two left, left behind, then Ooh, wow. it, it's changed, hasn't it? Yeah, and those those pear drops that you mentioned with uh, our first one tonight uh, is now just screaming out of the glass at me. Mm, that's that's really changed, hasn't it? Mm. Wow, that's that's like walking down the pear and apple aisle at uh, your local grocer. Which might just go to show just how much wine influence there kind of was on the periphery of that eighteen, perhaps that we just sort of. Uh, when you go back to ex-bourbon whiskey for in a moment, it's like, oh wow, it's actually it was it was all there, you know. Well, I, I think also that the 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 cast seventy eight we had was quite a bridge, and and you know took us over there into that territory. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 our palates came along for the ride very quickly. Uh, Jesse asks, are we having a textures of whiskey virtual tasting coming up in twenty two? It's not a worst <laughs> idea. Yes, it, it's a it's a pretty good one. That's a pretty good one. Um, you know what? It was actually a member. It was members sort of suggesting an Andrew's idea about coming up with next month. I mean, we we do listen to member feedback on this kind of stuff and what you guys are interested in tasting and and it's like interested in exploring and learning more about and tasting through, which is why we'll talk about March virtual later on. We're almost there, um, but we in the meantime we might move to ah, it's time for one forty eight point two. I, I really like that. Imagine trying to, uh, we'll have to work really hard on the copy that we come up with to sell a, a whiskey around texture. It's like, um, <laughs> you, do you remember that tasting we did uh, in Sydney? Um, I can't remember. Were you there for the uh, the bread and whiskey tasting? At, yeah, um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah. I was literally talking about bread and whiskey tasting today to Susie about, there was a reference to it anyway. That, that was the most amazing tasting and it wasn't particularly well attended because everyone thought, oh, bread and whiskey, how boring is that? And I, to this day, I think it's one of the most extraordinary, powerful, enjoyable, and and from a culinary point of view, exciting and explosive tastings uh, we've ever done. It was just mm. a, an unbelievable uh, experience. And yet um, trying to sell and, and promote that notion in, in our wording and phrasing uh, and how, how we build it, you know, bread and whiskey, it, it was a tough ask. And I'm, I think trying to uh, build and sell a tasting around the notion of texture would have a similar um, challenge, I suspect. Perhaps, perhaps, but I've already got the name for it. It's called the sandpaper and silk. Oh, well, the, cricketers, and silk. The, the, the cricketers will love that too. <laughs> too soon, too soon, too soon. Too soon. <laughs> I've just I've I've poured my one four eight and I'm enjoying the colour straight away. That's uh, that's very tasty. Sorry, <laughs> very appealing. I should say very appealing. <laughs> Out well, of we, do, we, do, we do taste with our eyes. So. We do a little bit. Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, for better or for worse. Uh, out here on the farm, my whiskey is often textured by uninvited insect guests. Yep, <laughs> if they fly into your glass, it's going to happen. Now, um, this has got a cool history behind it, so I'm going to pop up the caption here. There it is, 148.2. Um, we did a special little sort of media launch uh, of this cask just two or three weeks ago before its release uh, at the distillery. There it is in its element, surrounded by some uh, media and guests just exploring it. It's you know This was sort of just coming out of lockdowns, of course. And this is a, a feature whiskey where we had the whole cask for Australian members of Kirsch Me Quick in Feb Outturn. There's what it used to look like. That's what the distillery used to look like, of course, where we... Uh, sourced this cask from and where we sourced 148.1 from uh of course that was a much older cask this is a little bit younger this one this is a three-year-old uh first fill x-red wine barrique 
and I love showing these photos of sort of the production of, of the, you know, it's being made here and, and being like labeled, bottled, stick it up and everything here. Uh, and yes, every single bottle uh, for 148.2 was hand bottled, hand labeled. And that's a much different proposition from how it works in Scotland. Um, but, you know, everything looked and you know, the, the QA was there and everything looked great and it everything came together and we were really happy that Andrew and I picked out this cask and, and presented it to the UK tasting panel who, who also loved it. And uh, there you can see the stills on the new site compared to old site of where this distillate came off. Uh, very pretty set of frilly stills there in uh, Port Frilly. Melbourne. <laughs> frilly, yeah, frilly, yeah, exactly. Frilly and pretty. Uh, and um, there's some of the downstream team that we worked with on picking out some of these whiskies. And uh, there's the bar at the distillery itself. But yeah, I thought we might um, have a taste of this. This was the feature whiskey. And so this is sort of what actually brought together the whole sort of wine and spice theme for this month uh, with 148.2, spicy and sweet, Kirschmi quick, an Australian whiskey, the third ever Australian whiskey we've released uh, and distilled April 2017 and 55.5% uh, ABV. This was filled at 55. So it actually has gone up a little bit over three years, but quite a tight cask. And um, we, we sort of touched on this before, Andrew, about how wine casks, uh, especially when used in short periods of extra maturation or finishing uh, and second fill and whatnot, can be, you know, can be quite effective, much in the same way that a short maturation on a first fill in a much warmer climate than Scotland can produce a very different result as well, like this one. Yeah, and 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 that's that's been the the challenge for a lot of Australian distilleries. Uh, you know, putting their spirit in in the first fill wine casks that are extraordinarily active, uh, and then trying to control that maturation as as the oak uh, and the wine influence really drives it quickly. And, and in our warmer uh, temperatures and climate, um, that that's the challenge, particularly for the for the distilleries here that are that are using small casks. Um, this I, I remember when we were tasting uh, this Matt. Um, we had, we had uh, a couple of others that we were considering, and mm. there was initially some concern that uh, about this one's age that it was it was quite youthful compared to some of the others we were trying that were older, and yet uh, this one just hit that that magic balance of of just having everything right, and and therefore uh, all of a sudden the age was irrelevant. Uh, it, it 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 tasted great, it, it hit its straps, it was ready to bottle. Let's do it. Mm. And, and you and I tasted it at two years, and then we tasted it two point seven. And then we tasted it again at about 3.5, and that's when we bottled it. Uh, so it's technically three and a half-ish years old or so, but we still have to call it a three. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, uh, yeah, it's, I think the tasting notes here of it about being quite like those mentholated herbs, chocolate and salty, sugary syrups kind of thing going on. The nose is sort of almost, in this whiskey's case, a, um, a preview of what to expect uh, a, a, of the whole story. And then the palate on this one it, it takes another sort of turn entirely. For, for me, um, certainly on the back of, of the three predecessors, when you enter this fourth one tonight, uh, and, and uh, with the, as I say, the three preceding whiskies as, as a backdrop, this just explodes in confectionery territory for me. Um, mm. It's like I'm going down to the school tuck shop and coming back with your bag of mixed lollies. It's just everything inside there is just sweet and juicy and confectionery like, uh, just delicious. Mm, absolutely. There's a, a great question there from uh, David G. Uh, Matty, you're able to bring that up. Yeah, let's, let's, let's throw this up on screen. Um, uh, there's a couple of comments here from David G. The first one says, somehow I scored a bottle number one of this release. Much personal history of the distillery. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. They are all bottle one number one. I'm sorry to burst your bubble on that, but it's one of uh, 270. Um, but they, <laughs> if you manage to score one of those, it's very cool. Uh, and um, he's, another comment from David says, uh, would you care to discuss the early single cask bottlings from the likes of Carwin Sellers and Whiskey and Almond compared with this contemporary expression, please? We can. And in fact, I was quite involved with one of those releases, which was very cool. Um, but this is, uh, yeah, that, what would you, um, Andrew, if you want to start off, I don't mind either way. But No, I'll, I've, I've, I've had um, uh, not as much involvement with this distillery as you have. So I think you're far more qualified to answer this one. Well, I mean, that. Those, those bottlings, David, early on, they, they were the New World Project bottlings from this distillery, and they were experimentations into different things that the distillery could do. And it was actually a way, um, I don't know if this is public knowledge, but this was a way for the distillery to engage with whiskey drinkers because when Starwood first hit the market, 
it wasn't really sort of very popular yet because no one knew what it was. And, you know, it was sort of like this $80 bottle of single malt that was no one had ever heard of. It was $20 dearer than Glenfiddich 12. And it's sort of like, what do you, where do you position that in the market? And then they released this range of new old projects, which of which the founder of the distillery himself uh, was very much against even doing. And, but they came around to doing it and made these project bottlings with different bottle shops and different bars. So Louis Bar uh, did it, Whiskey and Almond, Carwin Cellars, um, Baron Owls. They did all these different sort of bottlings with these different groups. Uh, and it was those groups that went in and just sort of worked with the distillery, much like we did in picking out the cask or casks that they were after. Um, so in some ways, that was very much, a lot of that was Essendon spirit um, that they were picking out. So it was that yeah. sort of era of where the distillery was in Essendon. Uh, so the cool thing about what we've done is that 148.1 was Essendon spirit, 148.2 is Port Melbourne spirit. So this might actually be, this 148.2 might actually be one of the first, well, it's not one of the first single casks from that distillery, but it is probably one of the first ones you've maybe tasted because it's, it's uh, there weren't very many before this. It's This was distilled 2017. They only moved in properly full operational in late 16 into Port Melbourne. So it's, uh, yeah, I hope that makes sense. I don't know if anything else I can help with that, but. It's another whiskey where for me, um, a little drop of water doesn't hurt it, actually. Um, um, it, it actually becomes a little bit more syrupy with water, which is often counterintuitive, but does occur occasionally. I'm going to try that out. There's actually a comment here, which I should have touched on at the beginning of this tasting, this 148. Are the 11 bottles of 148.2 on the site now a glitch? No, they're not. We actually tucked away 12 bottles. So one's already vanished in the last few minutes, obviously. But we tucked away 12 bottles of this particular cask for tonight's tasting. We don't like to taste these whiskeys in these little bottles and then go, oh, you really love that. You can't get it anymore. That's really kind of like frustrating for members. So we like to maintain, except with the exception of 78.44, which is far more popular than we realized, the um, 148.2, which is also far more popular than we realized, uh, is this, we set aside two cases. Uh, 12 bottles are sitting up on the website now. If you missed out on this, now's your chance to get it if you missed out on the ballot. If you already won the ballot, here's your chance to get a second bottle. Uh, so your call, um, It's there's some there's a few up on the site. I, d I doubt they'll last the night, so um, your call. I think, I think that's... Uh... That's something I, I touched on, uh, and I, I'll, look, please forgive me, I can't remember whether it was in February outturn, I, I wrote it for March outturn, and it's yet to be published, but um, uh, I made that comment about the fact that we are always releasing stuff and putting stuff on the website at, at, at different times and randomly, and uh, we often like to not necessarily make a song and dance about it, we just like to put stuff there, and I'm trying to encourage members to focus less and less on on our turn day and you know, everyone trying to get madly online at, at 12 noon on a friday um there is always fantastic new releases and new stock that we don't often promote we don't always uh, uh sing about throughout time we don't always notify members with an email but there is stock we have and we carry all the time that we just upload to the website because that's a that's a 24 hour, uh, 7 shop it's always there and we want members to be able to visit that shop at any time of day and find new exciting releases also, plenty of casks that we bring in just exclusively for tastings. We'll never put it on an outturn. We'll never email it out to members, but it will be featured at a tasting in one of our capital cities. And then there'll be some stock left over from that that we then put up on the website. So I encourage members all the time, check out the website. It's, it, there is so much more there in our shop than you will ever see if all you ever do is pay attention to outturns and special releases through email uh, campaigns. You're absolutely right. And on just on that last point of um, event stock, I mean, Andrew's bang on there. Like there's some whiskeys we get where there's like, we might get literally 12 bottles in the country or, or six. Six, 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 even. Yeah, true. Like even six, like one case. And it's like, oh, you know what? That's enough for one event. And it might be an event in Canberra or Hobart or something. And you go, that's kind of fun. And they, they go through two bottles. They sell maybe two or three. And then there's like one left. It's like, oh, what do we do this one bottle? Just sneak it up on the site. And eventually it just it, it vanishes with sometimes within seconds or sometimes minutes. But it's worth checking out the site because there are things we get that just like you say, oh, I never saw that before. I didn't see it. I didn't see that in outturn. You can't just rely on outturn. There's going to be weekly releases as well as events and things like tonight where we have some stock available from the virtual, which is kind of exciting, like this 148.2. So uh Mal, not a not a glitch. If it was a glitch, then we'd probably have to honor it. So there you go, it's all yours. Um Another a great tasting note from Scott here. 148.2 is like a raspberry slash sarsaparilla cordial. Oh, wow. 
but still light all the same. The finish hangs around too. I'm 100% uh, uh, with Scott there on that raspberry note. When I was talked about, uh, you know, the, the the bag of mixed lollies from um, from the Swill Tuck Shop, I was specifically thinking of the little raspberry jubes you used to get in those, those raspberry jelly lollies. Um, so, yeah, 100%. Well, well, well picked. Uh, I haven't added water to this one. Adding water seems to bring out the pleasant funk of almost fresh red stained wood. Ooh. Ooh, I like that idea. I like that idea. And Jesse says uh, fig and quince jam with chocolate cacao. Um, a touch of caramelized bananas beneath the other fruits, or perhaps even hokey pokey ice cream. Hokey pokey. Is that like that's like one of those Ben and Jerry's flavors, isn't it, or something? I can't yeah, keep it. You, 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 you grab a spoon and you put your left arm in and then your left arm out and you taste it. And, yeah. Right. That's it. That's it. Okay. Fine. Fine. That was good. That was good. I'll, I'll, I'll see myself out. <laughs> yeah. It was fun. yeah uh, th look at the time. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm here all week. Try the veal. Yeah. <laughs> Please try the fish. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we are tasting 148.2 Kirschman Quick. This is, I consider, a part of society's history. It's not a dot one, but it is a dot two, but that's irrelevant. It's, it's a really special moment for us to say this isn't just us. We could have just called Starwood and gone, I said the distillery name, doesn't matter, but we could have just called the distillery and gone, Hey, uh, send us a cask. You know, it's like, oh, send, like, can we bottle up something that's good? No, no, no. This was a process that took, I'm going to safely say, like, 17, 18 months uh, back and forth of, you know, like, from, hey, guys, let's have that discussion again to let's get some samples, let's get some samples, let's get some samples, and try again, try again, try again, try again, pick out exactly what we're after. And we're always looking for that interesting and unique profile that just something in which we go oh wow that really sings and um, let's go with that cask over the other 50 that you've picked out kind of thing so this is kind of exciting especially for andrew and i and the, and susie and, and danelle and the whole team and adam uh where we've we've gone well this is just this predates adam so don't worry about that but this is sort of like one of those moments where we say like we've, we've picked out this cask and had a lot of fun with it and said wouldn't members really appreciate something like really unique like this and that's that's the whole purpose of these and uh, bring it to you at a, at a good price that you can enjoy and open up and if you are looking for one for your stash and one for your open open shelf, then um, this is a good opportunity with those 12 on the site now. Um, so there we go. Uh, and Gary, oh, Gary, good to see you, mate. Hope you're well. Tried this the other day and it's a great dram. Gary, uh, I think you drink more Australian whiskeys than I, I've had hot dinners. So I would, I'm actually going to take that as a, as a high accolade from you. Um, but yeah, we are on 148.2. There we go. But important whiskey for us. I, I'm really proud with this one. Yeah, no, well, well done. Absolutely. I've more or less uh, finished my, my dram. There's just a tiny little dribble at the bottom there, but what's coming out of the glass on the nose is still singing. It's uh, it's, it's not at all gone tired. My, my faculties have not tired of it. It's, it's just so rich and giving. <laughs> I like that usage. My faculties have not tired of this dram. I like that. I'm going to use that one. My faculty. You're welcome to. You. <laughs> you, you, you can have that one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, red red wine barrique. Do we know the red wine? Uh, this In this case, it will be a South Australian red wine. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm, I want to dig a little deeper. Do we know Shiraz, uh, Clara? Uh, uh, if we don't know, we don't know. I'm just I don't think we know. This. No, I don't okay. think we know. It was just sort of, you know, SA sourced. Sure. Probably Shiraz. Probably Shiraz. The, the thing is that let's just talk about availability. Whilst Because we are talking about wine and spice tonight. What With availability of wine casks, to put that into context for a second of where you source these casks from. I mean, uh, distillery on 48 source all of the, uh, predominantly wine cask matured whiskies. Like 80, 90% of their output is out of, is in X wine casks because we have such a vibrant wine winery um, growth. We have so many wineries in Australia so that are using these casks. In fact, we have over 2,400 wineries in Australia. So that means that there's availability of those casks to mature whiskey in. Uh, and so compare that to Scotland where there's about six wineries. And they, you know, they don't, Scotland are not known for making wine. They they get well, their, they are. It's just really terrible wine. 
Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. And that's why if, if you're in Scotland, you drink French or Italian <laughs> wines. It's so much easier. Uh, whereas in yeah, in, in Australia, we have Australian wine. And that's why those casks are available. That, it, there's, a, there's a lot of context. It, it adds a lot of context when you talk about uh, the regional availability of these kind of uh, raw materials. And you can have that same discussion about grains and about water and about other parts that, that go into making each whiskey. But I mean, in terms of cask, that for those wondering why, why the, you know, how wine casks come about, especially in Australian context, that's one of the main reasons. All right. Well, I think we might head on to dram number five if uh, everyone's okay to, to, to jump into the next one. You're welcome to pour all five out and just just quietly i have really really been looking forward to whiskey number five tonight it's also the oldest whiskey in our lineup so flip over your um flip over your menu onto the back page and you've got cask 66.198 serene sunset satisfaction and if i'm being completely honest here i reckon that's a banging good price for a 23 year old coal-fired era distillate from distillery 66 this is very cool and by the way david g it's not just the process of selection but also the first time members like me to uh, can indulge in it you know what welcome to the club david um if this is your first virtual then welcome doubly welcome this is very exciting that you, you get to jump in on something like this um and and tasting sorry he's fit follow up by saying and tasting and discussion from a distillery with personal history rather than a far-flung island i've never visited well i, I hope you do get to visit that far-flung island called scotland it's, it's quite fantastic and Mal says, more 66s. I couldn't agree more. Um, love the 66s. Hugely underrated mainland, well, sorry, uh, Highland. Um, I'm going to say mainland anyway. But Highland um, uh, distillate and a, a distillery with a cool history. And I've actually not tasted this ever before. 53.1%, 66.198, Serene Sunset, so light, lightly petered to end. Again, because it fits our theme of a refill French oak barrique extra maturation so 21 years in bourbon wood two years in refill french oak i've got a i've got a real soft spot for this distillery i i really love it it's the most it's a beautiful place to visit um it, it's so wonderfully traditional in so much that it does it flies under the radar it, it's it's um it serves a lot of it's, it's one of those distilleries that churns out a few things for for its owners um you know for many years it was uh uh, a, a big contributor to what still is for that matter for teachers um and you know wind the clock back 40 50 years uh, uh teachers was you know renowned as one of the most malt heavy blends on the market it was it, the ratio of malt to grain was unusually high that's why teachers had such a a great reputation and uh you know uh also because uh, they were producing their blends they needed that little bit of, of of peat and smoke and 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 they thought they would do that in-house rather than bring in the really heavily peated stuff from uh, from isla uh, and that's where this distillery has just still uh for a good chunk of the year well actually the majority of the year um puts out a whiskey that's typically peated to about 14 to 18 parts per million fennels and i just love it it, it it's just wonderful and I, I think i could safely say i've never had a bad whiskey from this distillery but isn't it just amazing just the, the length of like tenure of that brand and like everything like it was like early or sorry late 1800s adam teacher and his dad bill teacher or whatever his name was who were blending well before even uh like and then it, it was it was bill it was william yeah you're, you're, you're dead right william sorry yeah william teacher and it's like it's, mm. we need to buy a distillery to you know like to to maintain our supply and then today in 2022 it's like we've got teachers still that uses this mall but yeah. when, and they have a very very uh uh what's the word yeah you know they have a core range bottling that that has gets no attention uh because it's uh it's, it's I'd, I'd say you'd probably better off buying a bottle of teachers but it's it's, <laughs> it's it's an okay core range there it is um but it you know it, we're lucky enough to get these amazing sort of single casks through the society of through code 66 for us which are um yeah i think uh if you go to the distillery, uh, which is actually you shouldn't because it's not open to, to the public, <laughs> but, um, it's still got the original, uh, the railway siding is behind the back there. It's no longer in use. The, the, the railway line got stopped to that uh, part of Scotland some time ago. Um, but just so traditional, everything around it. Uh, I, I met the distillery manager there in 2011, I think it was, Alistair, and uh, just so hospitable and friendly. Um, 
one of the, you know, you know, when you have an amazing experience at the distillery, you just become even more in, uh, in, endeared to the to the brand, or the brand becomes mm, more endearing yeah. to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, just just wonderful. And I'm nosing this now, and it's just got all those hallmark signature notes that I that I love with this distillery. The peat is there; it's a very soft bed of smoke underneath the malt. There's that sweet fruitiness that is there, um, and that's. In, inter- in this case, that's probably a combination of, of the fruitiness from the distillate as well as the influence of the of the, the French cast, the French oak barrique. It, and it's so complex. And then you've got the majesty of, of what, uh, you know, 23 years can, can do to a whiskey. It's so fragrant and perfumed on the palate. It's just lovely. I think I, I get classic, like old 66 on the nose, like a sweet peat, uh, lovely softness on the nose. But on the palate, I get that. I get the wine cask on the palate and it it's it this is a perfect example of where the wine cask does not get in the way of the distillate you know what there would have been an absolute sort of like the i, I like to the, the absolute nads of a decision to go oh like i'm gonna like take this 21 year old 66 and put another two years of french oak in it like there's there's a decision made there by ewan and the spirits team to go that's we want to take this in a different direction and see what happens and that's so exciting because it, it's it's so it's just lovely it's just well he's, he's, he's nailed it and um uh two quick things i'd, I'd, I'd quickly say to that uh, i was going to mention this earlier but back when we were talking about glenn morange and bill lumsden bill shared with me uh, in a conversation over a few drams uh, many years ago he said for every uh hit for every win that they get for every experiment he does that you know that they decide as a success and they decide to bottle he said there'll be three or four experiments that are disasters and they've just got to uh you know they don't tip it down the drain, of course. It gets blended away into something else. Um, but he said finishing is a really hard task and um, not not everything is success. You can't just put something into a wine cask and assume it'll work out well. Uh, and, and you know, part, part of the the part, part of the, the, the beauty of being one of the pioneers and the guys that have they've done that now, you know, they've learned what works and what doesn't. And, and his advice was that most of the time it doesn't work. So I, I agree with you. You know, Ewan's decision to um, to put this in and uh, turn out make it a winner at the other end was just inspired genius. So, so uh, well done, Mr. Campbell. Absolutely. He, I, I keep saying he gets better and better all the time as a yeah as a finisher and as a blender. And speaking of which, uh, his next um, uh, heresy, his next blended experiment, Clementine Confit, is out in March out turn. So that keep an eye out for that one. Which I've I've tasted it a couple of times now, and it's it's. It's just getting, he's just getting better and better as a blender. So yeah, uh, I say congrats out to you. 100%. Um, Matt, would you agree that this, uh, this whiskey delivers even more on the palate than the nose prepares you for? Yeah, that's sort of what I was saying before about how the palate is just got like so much more life to it than I was expecting. Because mm. the nose is all soft and, and like sweet and peat, but like the, 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 uh, the finish and the, and the, and the palate on this are just lovely. I, I just love the fusion between sweet and peat. Uh, it it mm. is a it's a perfect marriage. It's dovetailed beautifully. Sometimes you can have those finishes where it's a bit of a clunky marriage. It doesn't quite work. It's a bit dissonant. Mm. Uh, this is this is just beautiful. This is unison and harmony at the same time. If that makes sense. See, I would argue here's here's a bit of a controversial take. Maybe I would argue that most peated peat and sherry don't mix most yes now we've, we've had that chat before, I, had agree. The chat before and, and I don't think we had that on stream but we've had that chat in person before where we've said yeah you know if there's some great peated whiskeys out there that are you know ex bourbon refill bourbon first fill whatever and there's some great sherried whiskeys out there that are completely unpeated you know you're glenn farkley of the world and and whatnot but then you have uh rarely do the two come together very rarely do the two come together and i think this actually strikes a balance very nicely because it, it, again, much like the uh, the eighteen dot three seven we tasted tonight. If you hadn't, if I didn't know this was from a French oak cask, if this hadn't had any wine influence, I wouldn't have known. I, I would have said it's just it's it's picked up a real sweetness from somewhere here, but it's very subtle on the on the French oak here, which is a refill French oak. I mean, it's... well, I, I'm not going to um, beat around the bush. Uh... The preceding four whiskies tonight have all been spectacular. If I was scoring them, I would give them all unusually high scores. Uh, but uh, this wins for me. That, that's that's my top scoring dram of the night. Yeah, that is fantastic. And uh, as we touched on, as I touched on very briefly at the start, it's it's a. This is also a, a bit of a timepiece because this is some of the this is 1997 distillate. This is 
before 2001, which is when they changed from coal to steam. Uh, so this is a very different distillate. I found, I've always found the pre-2001 distillate uh, 66s to be a fair bit heavier, oilier, uh, very different dif distillate from what we see today. It's still fantastic today. I mean, the younger ones we get are unbelievably good, but it is a different era of the distillery and it's always worth exploring. Have you uh, have you read or heard about the stories and the, the length of time they took when they did the changeover uh, from coal to steam and the amount of time it took them and the tinkering they had to do around the edges with the uh, with the, the the super coolers and all the rest of it um, to try and 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 replicate the spirit uh, as it was prior to the change it, it was a tortured path for them it took them <laughs> so long and they they eventually got there but uh, yeah it. Um, you got to you got to feel for them when you've been using a, a particular way to to make your spirit for the best part of a hundred years, and all of a sudden you can't because of OH and S requirements. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, they did well. I'm just going to speed through some comments. Uh, Jesse says one of my favourites uh, teachers. Uh, I always start the school year with school year with a new bottle. Uh, I was gifted a '66 and found it like a barbecue sauce in whiskey form. Loved it. Yeah, it's it's a great spirit, and I think people who have especially peated whiskey appreciators uh, who skip over this distillery are missing out on some uh, some cracking stuff. Uh, Paul says, getting some 80s Lafroy vibes here. I like that. And uh, yeah. Charter. Well, sorry. So that, that's that's worth elaborating on. Let's not forget that uh, Lafroy and this distillery uh, come under common ownership these days. They do indeed. One mm. of them gets a lot of profile and one of them doesn't. Um, charred apricots and uh, pineapple with anchovies. Sounds like a controversial pizza topping, but tastes amazing. Now, um, Mal asks a question for AD here. Is AD an Elsa Bay fan? They toot their sweet Pete Horn. Uh, the answer is yes, I am. In fact, I've, I've got two bottles downstairs right now. I always find Elsa Bay to be very technically brilliant whiskey. Does that make sense? It's I, I know what you mean. I, I'd have used the word clean. Yeah, it's, it's very clean. Very clean, very clean. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, uh, David, you're, you're on the same page as me here. No, I picked this as wine oak finished. Exactly. And um, only two of those 148s left, which is also a good point to say that this 66.198 was almost sold out as well. This was previously featured in Outturn. There's only two left of the 66.198 Serene Sunset Satisfaction. One left of 66. Uh, if you beat this, if you beat Andrew's punch to this, then you know, um, uh, tough cookies. But here you go. Yes, this definitely wins. Agreeing with Andrew's uh, Dram of the Night comment there. Uh, and agree, Andrew, um, when I did the tasting last week, love this Dram. Oh, that must be Dove who tasted this in uh, who tasted this in the Brisbane tasting. Was it? Was that Dove saying that comment? Anyway, um, and the finish here is the is the hero here. A brilliant transition from a little vanilla, lemon juice, menthol, so mouth watering. Scott, I I agree. Uh, whoa, whoa, stop, stop, Scott. We're we're giving you a job. That, that is, <laughs> you're hired. <laughs> you're, you're hired. That those are fantastic notes. I. Uh, I'm a big fan of seeing the word hero in any set of tasting notes. Uh, no, well done. Sold out apparently. Okay, so maybe the 66 has sold out after tasting it and just now with us. Um, but that's okay. Look, there's other 66s coming through. Uh, there's one in March outturn even. Wow, the Dallai Farmer. So uh, well worth having a look at that one as well. Uh, as I said, you, you, if you skip over the 66s thinking that like, ah, like, oh, I don't only get Isla Pete or something like that, it's like... Open, open your world a bit to something like this, and it's it's another it's another uh, it just changes everything for you yet again. Well, I, I think you need that. That's again. I'm just going to digress for a moment. Oh, good uh, idea. Yeah, we we had a um, uh, we had our, our, our whiskey sorry Sydney uh, whiskey summer dinner uh, just this week uh, with yeah. with France Sure at Red Lantern, and uh, we had an amazing um, uh, Peter whiskey that night that wasn't from Ireland. That was one of the comments I made to, to, to the audience that evening. The fact that the society. Uh, is really uh, pushing the envelope with, with sourcing peated whiskies, uh, not just from around Scotland, but from around the rest of the world that aren't from Isla. You know, there are some amazing uh, smoky peaty drams uh, being made all over the place, particularly in Scotland, um, that, that don't come from Isla. You know, don't don't put the blinkers on and assume it's got to come from that tiny little island to give you the, the peat and smoke that we like. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm, wow. I'm really enjoying that 66. That's just lovely. Just yeah, I'm, uh, out, you know, and tonight was all about wine and spice. It was, it was about exploring wine cask finished whiskies, and and what that does to the spirit. And I think this has been a really entertaining and uh, in, insightful look at at what they how the spirit reacts in different ways. And sometimes it's a lot of a uh, lot of wine influence. Sometimes it's just a little, but the way it sort of 
grabs each whiskey in a different way and takes it on a different journey has been part of the fun of this, I guess. Yeah. Um, there we go. March out turn is around the corner. Um, just to put a just to put a, a, a cap on this. March out turn is of course around the corner. There it is. Um, you we can... we actually uh, uploaded that today, did we not, Matt? That's now gone out live for members. That's right. Um, they can uh, members can read March out turn. It is out next. It's on the website right now. It's in your inbox right now. It's on our social medias right now. You can catch it next Friday, fourth uh, fourth of March. It's our second official issue for the year of our big music and malts, which is music and malts is covering both March and April outturns this year. So you've got lots of listening to get through. Each whiskey has been paired up with a song just for a bit of fun, a song that sort of pairs with each cask in a way, which uh, I'd love to hear your comments about what you think of each one once you've picked up a bottle maybe and had a scan of the QR. I think we're all pretty good at scanning QR codes by this point. <laughs> uh, so there, there's the out turn. Um, new releases online midday, ADT, Friday 4th of March. That's, uh, been- that, that's cassette. That cassette tape was making me very sem- sentimental then. Uh, uh, yeah. did, did you feel like getting the pencil out and, and rolling it back? You oh, know, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I, spent my, I spent my life doing that with some some tapes. Yeah. <laughs> um, there we go. And uh, thank you so much um, to this comment. SMW's podcast is awesome. Music and it, it absolutely is. And there have been some – oh, great comment here. There have been some two wonderful Swedish Peter Drams, 144 and 145. Indeed. Yeah, we've had some great – Heated Swedish malts. Uh, and uh, more, the- more, more to come, Matt, too. I, I think I uh, actually just uh, placed an order with Scotland for, for some more uh, of that down the track. Fantastic. They were they were popular once people had tasted them because it was sort of one of those sort of leaping points of, ah, what is a Swedish peated malt like? Um, and when's the Aussie peated stuff coming out? Oh, I mean... Uh, I'm, it's coming. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there we go. My foot's in it now. Um, and then uh, talking Peter whiskey, um, the recent 137 is amazing. Yeah, the, oh, English Peter whiskey. That's another one. Another one to absolutely keep an eye out for. Yeah. Um, if you're a Pete head, yeah, there you go. You got to check these kind of things. That's been wine and spice. Um, thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you so much, all of our guests. Thank you, Matt. That was that was a lot of fun. That was very tasty. Uh, wonderful experience and pleasure to spend a Friday night with you again. As always. As always. Now, uh, keep an eye out. As I said, I'd mention it before we finish up for tonight. Keep an eye out for the next virtual tasting. There it is, the Rock and Rollers of Rum. Uh, our cellar master, Andrew Debbage, has put this one together uh, for a full, um, massive rum tasting. If you're one of those members that's looked at some of our um, looked at some of the rums and gone, oh, I want to sort of explore some of the rums, see what, what the society does with rum, because you've seen what we've done with whiskey. We are well outside the sort of the normal realm of whiskey we are exploring full flavored car strength whiskey always so what happens when we apply that same logic to rum this is what we get we get amazing single cask rums that are just will blow you blow your socks off like this is the <laughs> is one thousand four hundred and seventy dollars worth of rum in that tasting uh because it's an absolutely massive lineup of some closed distilleries some really old rums some really new rums and everything in between so we're gonna listen to some rock and roll drink some rum and have a 16th of March virtual tasting. It's a little bit earlier in the month than usual because after the 16th, um, Andrew and I are pretty caught up with things like championship and other things coming elsewhere in the month. So we'll ho- hopefully see you up for the um, for the rum tasting. Uh, or um, what's the, here we go, um, fight juice tasting. <laughs> like, I mean, you're not wrong, but also we don't just, we don't encourage fighting at the society. So you know, I, I tell you what, you, you you taste the rums we have on that night. All you will want is love, not fighting. <laughs> and uh, a question here: When does the rum tasting kit come out? Comes out with out turn. It's in out turn. It's Friday the fourth of March. So keep uh, keep your diary tuned for the out turn as well as the virtual pack all going on sale next Friday. But of course, as Andrew said earlier, there's always things going up on the site. So if, if you're after something even midweek, have a look at have a look what's on the site. Always um always welcome to check out what we're p- popping up here and there. Thank you again, everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, and I will see we'll see you all. We'll see you all for rock and rolls of rum. You'll see me for more live streams and whatnot throughout the week and throughout the month. Uh, but in the meantime, that caps off our February wine and spice issue. And uh, we'll see you all for March out turn. Thanks again, everyone. Slangeva. Thank you.